Pleasure. I'm so enjoying and I so respect all of your professional expertise and your, in, your wonderful observations and many, many, many challenges that you all deal with. So as we go forward today, again, reassuring you at any point, I so want to hear your, your voice and raise your hand at any point at all along the way. Um, as we proceed here now, we're still talking about aggregating data and gathering data that's all over the place. Don't, so we're, we're um, we are here. Again, there might be little places for you to fill in, so I don't want to go too rapidly. Um, okay, now maybe indeed what I need to do here is, okay, that's, we've actually been, okay. Okay, a f hugely important uh, consideration as we aggregate data is looking at the environments that our children are in. And so very frequently, raise your hands, those of you who are working with children who are deaf and hard of hearing in inclusive classrooms. Let me see your hands. Inclusive environments. A good share of you. Those of you in, in settings that are specialized uh, and you have control over lots of the variables, raise your hand. Yeah. And then, of course, there are many of you in itinerant. You go through as an itinerant, Jill, is that correct, Jill? So you see all kinds of, um, on the, on the uh, continuum of services, you see all kinds of things as an itinerant in Rockford. Uh, so. Antecedents, very, very big deal to consider the importance of the environment. The environment as antecedent. The environment sets the stage for what's going on. So if the teacher understands the implications of the deafness in the inclusive classroom, the child has a lot better chance of being successful in such an environment. I'm certain that you know, clearly that's, that is something that um, is quite easy to imagine. Sorry, no, sorry. Okay. Aspects of the environment. Fill out these, please. I have left little blanks for you. So what do you think those different aspects are? I gave you the first one. What are the other two? You think the emotional one would be another one here on your sheet? Fill out the words you think that would belong here in the other two aspects. I gave you the physical environment, which clearly matters a great deal. And we'll talk about the aspects of the physical environment. And I heard emotional, let me hear, pardon me, the social environment, what other might be on here? There are two more, there's one more blank. Academic. The academic and the uh, the, the learning environment, the academic environment, and then, of course, the social environment. I wonder how does this child f consider how he or she fits in to the social, um, the social exchanges of the classroom? How is the child faring with the learning aspect of the classroom and with the physical aspect of the classroom? When you think about the physical aspect. Again, now you could fill in your little sheet there that um, this is the physical aspect here. Um, and we can think about all kinds of different aspects of the physical environment. And you might add one. What's not on here that you think is really important? Is there anybody with, with uh, some aspect of the physical environment that is particularly important for the children you, ca you care mostly about here in, our, uh, as we, in, your, in your professional work? Is there anything left off? Thank you. They need to take into account their physical being. Are they hungry? Are they thirsty? Are they, what's their physical state? Their own physical needs. That's personal physical needs. Add it in. Absolutely. Are they hungry? Are they tired? You know, sometimes children go a long way to school every morning on a bus. And how do they feel at the end of a long bus ride? Very important notion. Their own physical. I was going to say the size of the furniture and things like that, like if the student's short compared to their peers. The furniture selection. Um, How, so as you go in and as you try to problem solve and as you try to unravel what might be going on here, are, is the child ready to learn here physically, 
Is the furniture appropriate for this child? What's missing? What else is missing from the physical aspects of the environment? Kind of goes with acoustics, I guess, but for our kids, mm -hmm. uh, batteries, cochlear implants, the working logistics of all of their amplification. Is everything working? Is everything on on? Because things are not going to work. So many aspects to the equipment, by all means, that make the physical environment a very, very, very big part of antecedent. So therefore, there are so many pieces to the puzzle, aren't there? Now, the next one, um, you might consider, what are these learning environment pieces? Okay, what are they? And look at the list I provided for you and tell me what's missing. Because certainly those ones you added are very much worthwhile. What's, what's part of the learning environment in addition to these? Positive, Our positive, atmosphere. Po positive atmosphere and focus on learning. Is learning seen as a positive thing? Yeah, positive disposition toward learning, that idea. So as you go into a classroom, what kind of attitude toward learning is going on in here? How is the teacher setting the stage for a positive attitude toward learning? Anything else? Or what strikes you as interesting or different or surprising on that list? Any? They're all rather predictable, maybe, are they? Or, and yes, thank you. Uh, what is meant by instructional demands? What do you think? do this or practice this testing or practice stuff that isn't always ideal for the students, but yet they have to do it anyway, so it kind of that it impacts the environment, obviously, because they're trying to do something that isn't working and they've still got to do it. The instructional demands, are they appropriate? That's, any other considerations about, are the instructional demands appropriate? different but maybe just the students cognitive demand so if they have slower processing time it might go on with like accommodations or modifications just giving them that additional wait time or things like that that you would need to be aware of the instructional demands relative to the children's needs little susan she has unique instructional demands doesn't she because she cannot keep pace with her peers as she becomes a second grader and a third grader. She's going to need a different instructional demand than her little peers, you know. Um, also, sometimes the instructional demands really require a lot of organization. Maybe they need a lot of um, verbal communication and all kinds of issues that might indeed cause all kinds of challenges for youngsters. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So, um, and any other thoughts on instructional demands and are they appropriate? Oh my goodness. I don't that comment correctly, but I think instructional demand also goes with is the material challenging enough yet not too challenging uh, for the children to be engaged? Excellent point, because it's such a, a discerning. Teachers have to be such good discerners. You know, they have to know what is too difficult and what is too easy and just hit it right on the on the nail on the head as though you know what is appropriate obviously you can make those decisions without plenty assessment data and plenty data to help decision making you know and plenty information kim I say also with instructional demands or maybe for um, modifications, a lot of the times in deaf ed you have different levels in your classroom. So making sure that your higher student doesn't get the same material as your lower student and that each worksheet or packet or whatever it is you're doing fits the need of that student. Some it's can be pushed more such a some challenge, isn't it? It's, uh, the teacher's work is never done in, that certain, in a certain sense because you have such variance, such child variance in your classroom and trying to meet the instructional needs of each one of them in all different areas, in the area of math, in the area of language arts, in the area of any imaginable thing, you know? Like, how am I gonna meet the instructional needs of, of this child in this environment, you know? And then being very flexible with the use of graphics and the use of modifications and accommodations that were mentioned over here, you know, we can meet the instructional needs of the child. So. Um, 
and we, you know, that is our, that is our huge effort. And uh, as we consider the next part of this, let us see what you would add to this or take away from this. Do you agree that these are the kinds of social things that are antecedents for the kinds of things we observe in classrooms? You write in social environment. What is it that makes the environment an antecedent for positive things? Yes? Uh, Student-parent uh, interactions. The social, you'd add that in, wouldn't you? If it's not a year already, teacher-student interactions, peer-student interactions, and parent-school interaction, perhaps you could write, or parent-teacher. Uh, parent-child, too. Parent-child, parent-school, parent-teacher. The parents in relation to the school entirely. Parents, because the parents are our best allies. We have to consider that the home and the school are the child's two most important environments. They are our allies. And if we can have parents that are working with us, the child is in the best case for success. You know, because you know, both the kinds of things that are being learned at home can carry over into school and get practice. The things that are learning at home, their children are learning in school, go home and get practice. And the child in the two most, the environments they spend most time in, if we can get those aligned well, we have the best case scenario. And clearly the job of aligning those well takes a great deal of creativity and a great deal of hard work. And there's a lot to be learned about how do we pull in our parents. There's actually a lot written on that. How do we pull in our parents to, to work with us and the special needs of their children. And parents who understand their children's needs are in such a better position to work therapeutically with them at home and to work creatively and extend the good things that are happening both at home and in school. You know? So parents, thank you so much for that observation. What else needs to go in here? Socially, what's missing? Aspects of the social environment. Yes? Uh, emotions towards peers. Peer, say that again now. Pe emotions towards uh, socialize, socializing with other people. By all means. So the notion of peers and you know, the parents, the child's interactions with peers. It's such a big deal, isn't it? And if the parent, if the, you know, the child can work well with peers, it makes such a, such a huge difference. And that's such a challenge, clearly, when the little child has, you know, deaf and communication, articulation, and all those kinds of things. Efforts need to be made. And in fact, I've read articles that talk about how to help peers be receiving of the special needs of their of their own peers in their classrooms. There are things that can be done about that. Yes? For our population accepting their deafness and their hearing loss? Self-acceptance and peer acceptance. Self-acceptance and peer acceptance. The whole notion, too, of anybody with a special need, you know, like uh, little Susan has to get to know herself and her own needs and get to accept herself and all her uniqueness, you know? And then, of course, the more the, the child can be self-accepting, then the, the better chance they are of being able to participate with peers and, and be with their peers. So, but it, these things don't happen without effortful work on the part of teachers. You know, real effortful programming. They do not happen unless those kinds of things are going on. So, Excellent comments, and there's a great deal, obviously, to, to consider. And when you think about fostering peer relationships and fostering self-acceptance, these are huge efforts. They take extraordinary um, effort on our part as, as professionals. So um, then the environment, observing the environment. Let me share with you that in your packet, there is a little informal instrument that you could use and you could take it and you could and you could reorganize it and in fact I have it here but I haven't opened it so um, I'll ask you to just look at your your little printed 
unpack it and, um, and, and see that there are so many aspects to the environment that you can you know, go in there and assess it and see is this aspect of the environment, you know, on a scale of one to four, is it strong or is it not so strong? And again, take the little, uh, it's on your email as well. It can be on your email if it isn't already as an attachment and then you could play with this as an informal instrument. You all have that in your packet, right? Um, what I'm referring to here is this. And um, you can, you know, go in there and observe environments. Sometimes having something like this will help a teacher to see that the physical space, the social space, the learning space, you know, that there are little aspects of it that might be improved. And it might help you to, to uh, organize your observations. And again, take this, rework it, if you were to rework it thematically, or I've even used it with a yes, no, instead of a little scale of one to four, you could do a scale of one to four, or else, is the lighting appropriate, yes or no? You know, or on a scale of one to four, it is a three or a one or some such thing. But basically speaking, what are we doing? We're taking the environment seriously. And we're trying to find ways to um, maximize the chance that the environment is what it needs to be. So, um, Uh, so, as we proceed, uh, is that better sound for you all rather than uh, without the microphone? Okay, thank you. Data from a variety of sources. Again, I have for you uh, an added little piece of information. We are going to be thinking about looking at a child's file, all what it is, all what is written in um, the, the background information. Data from any imaginable person who has provided evidence about what it is that might be needing our attention. So take those files very seriously, which you, I, you do, I'm sure. Then you can find many, many ways to assess these kinds of things. And I am providing here um, a sheet of paper that contains a long list of sources for further data collection. And um, As you go through your, your, um, your day as a teacher, you're getting work samples, you're observing child reading, you are the closed procedure, which is very, very interesting to think about. What does the child say when they're, when they're given a chance to put a word in that might be their choice of word? On that sheet, I would love to hear if there's something that surprises you. Oh, I never knew that was a data source. Is there anyone like that that might, or that you wish you saw more frequently used, perhaps? Is there anything on that list? Or that you like particularly that is helpful? I know it's still being uh, circulated. Is there anyone that you like particularly that... Um, yes, thank you. Retelling. I like a lot just because it, it kind of gives me an idea of where they are language-wise and then how much they are with comprehension and um, being able to sequence things. I feel like retelling tells you a lot. Retelling is a particularly interesting data source because it helps you to know what they have internalized and what are what are they keeping after a certain experience you know what do they what's what's their what do they pick up retelling it's a data source you know interviews interviews you know when i interview 
students and say, what do you like about school? What don't you like? They relax and they start really talking. You know, and I find that very valuable. So talk interviews with the child, asking them, what do you like? What do you wish for? That reinforcer survey, which is another thing on your packet, is so important. You can learn so much about what does the child find you know, helpful or what is difficult for the child. You know, so you're, you're talking to the child, making notes about what they're telling you is a very helpful thing for you. Very nice. Other things that's on that list that you love to use that's particularly helpful? Or any other observations about the list of things? There are so many ways to find out information. Work samples um, and, you know, so many ways to help us gather from varied sources to help our program development. Permanent products, those portfolios. Who loves to use portfolios? You, you uh, compile and make a, a collection of. So portfolios, work samples, um, methods for generating data. You might jot that down in your little space there. And also maybe tell me what, what the next one is here. Their child, teacher, therapist, family. What might be in there? What might be the word? What's that blank about, I wonder? Any guess? I kind of think you have got it. And the other one then, what is that last one on that sheet? Something about the child or adolescent and then there are all these methods. What's that word? Measurable data. Measurable data, you think? Other thoughts? Application. You think so, Sherry? I bet it is. Something like direct observation. Because when you use event recording, and we'll talk about how to do that as we uh, continue today, and how, I mean how to use our interviewing uh, event recording and interval and so on like that. So direct observation, huge, huge, um, data sources and frequently used. Yes? A variety of sources, and I guess I was thinking, but then I thought maybe it's the way you're taking data, how you write it up. You know, like your, the observations as a main data, because we see so much, but I suppose um, you could word it in how you're documenting what you're observing as part of the actual source. I don't know. You know what I mean? Because I was thinking when you were doing that, thing, like, what about just actually observing what it's that's right because you know it's so different if you have the number of times something occurred or how long something occurred it's very different data you know so it's just methodology around direct observation right it's different ways to go in there into a class and see how the child is faring how long a child is seated working quietly versus how many items they did in a 10 minute period or a 15 or 20. It's a really different way to directly observe, you know? So what do you want to find out? And then what method are you going to use to find out? Direct observation of the child using all these different methods that we have available to us, okay? So um, as we think about data generation, there are so many. The ones we just mentioned, and then on that long list of things, there are so many data sources. And then the, we'll talk this afternoon about even our own awareness about the wonderful data we have. Sometimes we don't quite give it proper labeling, and we don't give it the kind of um, inform you know, we don't write sufficient on it that a year from now it doesn't have the relevance that it could have. And we'll, I'll share with you how to make your, inf your information as relevant as possible and maximizing its potential as a data source. Obstacles. What are obstacles to aggregating data? What are obstacles to pulling it all together? What are obstacles to 
finding information, and then putting it into this hole, this gathering. Do you want to just jot down something on the on the list on the little on your paper here? And then we can you can share with your neighbor what you wrote. Alright? What are obstacles? Obstacles to our professional efforts. And you can talk loudly, by the way. You don't have to whisper at all. data. What did you jot down and what did you share? Did you hear surprises? You kind of, you heard some surprises? Time you think is a big obstacle to gathering information and putting it all into some coherent whole. Time is such a challenge. I think a lot of teachers find it challenging to collect data while they're teaching at the same time. So trying to simplify it so that you can do it on an ongoing basis without interrupting what you're trying to do as an educator. Such a challenge. We, it, we had one teacher one time when we asked her to collect data and she said, you mean while I'm teaching? Because she just couldn't wrap her head around being able to do both at the same time. And the interesting thing to consider, Sherry, is that she's already doing it though. Like she's getting a permanent product from the child. If she's the children, you know, she's asking them to do tasks. So it's a matter of what is it that you're going to use as your data source. So if it is that little set of sentences the child wrote, that's a permanent product. And that shows the child's writing, expressive writing, or spelling, or grammar and punctuation. You know, or if you, is your, data source interview, you know, like how many insightful things can the child say, you know, so, you know, what, what themes come up? So it's a matter of, I think, becoming aware that there are actually data sources at all times and becoming aware that I'm actually generating data already, you know. So, but then if it's really complicated and if you're trying to do a formal test, no, that's not, we're talking about informal data generation as opposed to formal data generation. Like a Woodcock Johnson, that's a whole different story, isn't it? It's a whole different story to, to conduct a Woodcock Johnson, you know, or to conduct a key math or such thing. That's, that, that's another data source, but it's not what we're talking about. We're talking about informal data that can be generated while you teach on a daily basis. We're social workers that are a problem with um, getting the teachers to do it because they are so busy and trying to get them up. And our case looks so large that we don't have a lot of time to just go in and observe in depth, you know, different kids. But then also being on the same page and making sure that if that somebody else doing the data collecting, what they perceive as this behavior or the intensity is not always the same. Being able to be on the same page and knowing the definition of the observable behaviors. Um, more so on behaviors than the concrete grades and stuff like that, like you, or academics that you were describing, but behaviors and things that we're trying to work on. Exactly. And what we perceive and what they perceive might be completely different. Right. So making sure that you're all on the same page with the actual behaviors. There are so many interesting, complicated issues going on because the world of a social worker as they observe the child and the world of a teacher as they observe it are so different. The other thing that's fascinating to keep in mind is that teacher to teacher, it's also different. They can, 
even two teachers can look at the same child and see the child so differently. Do you want to add to that, Linda? No, I was going to say that never. That never happens, Linda says. That all teachers think the same way. All, thinkers, all teachers think the same way. We were having that very same conversation yeah. before. Yeah. But it's not only that, but then the teacher comes to you, at, I'm the social worker, she's a psychologist, but they will come to us and say, he's having a behavior problem, he's got such a bad attitude, well, then that's not observable, and then you go in and observe, and what you think is a bad attitude, you don't necessarily think is a bad attitude, you're like, he's a teenager. Excellent point. These are really complicated issues. And do you know what they're relating to, actually? And it's important for us to know. At least when you meet this kind of thing, it's important for you to put it somewhere, right? You put it, you understand it, you expect it, and it isn't so upsetting anymore. You understand that it's easier to understand the social worker and the teacher on different pages. Because really the social worker's theoretical framework is really different. Because more than likely your theoretical framework is more ecological, isn't it? It's the life around the child. It's the family, it's the society, it's the television, it's the, you know, the life, the socioeconomic. So all of those variables. You're concerned more about ecology, whereas the teacher is concerned more about what has he learned or what has he not learned? It's behavioral theory. It's more the child focused, whereas the social worker is focused more on the environment. So it's a, they're coming, the world of a teacher and the world of a social worker, when you meet, you, you're speaking across different professional lines to some degree, and you can really understand that. Now I would say the same would be true of school psychology, Linda, or psychology. You know, like you're thinking differently about developmentally, you might think, you know, um, you might think, um, you know, maybe psychological theory, you know, you come at it differently, so you're going to see things differently. Whereas if we can, that's why behavioral theory helps us too. What do you mean he has a bad attitude? That's a good question for a teacher, by the way. Can you tell me what he's doing to show he has a bad attitude? That's a really helpful question because that helps you both to get on the same page. Can you, ha I understand that he has a bad attitude. Now, can you help, tell me more about how he shows me, he shows you he has a bad attitude. Tell me more and I really, really so value the notion of tell me more about because it's not a threatening kind of thing or anything else tell me more about the problem tell me more about this can you tell me more about it? and the more you can operationalize the better if you don't have a handle on it after the first in explanation still say tell me more about the part that uh, the peer part tell me more about the not finishing work part or tell me more about the way he behaves when he walks into school first thing in the morning tell me more about that part then I'll get a handle on what it is that you're really talking about so that is huge and trying to get to the same page and across professional lines the other thing to remember about teachers is that a teacher who is prepared to be teaching mathematics or English or French or science or such you know are prepared really differently from teachers who are prepared to teach elementary school children they really do. They have a really different program. Don't we know that? Who among you are prepared to teach elementary level? I guess we don't have too many people like that, do we? Are you, is your first degree in like a CNI kind of program where you taught, you were, you learned how to, or is it in special, where are you? you regular at teachers and at the elementary level, right? Now, when teachers are prepared to, for the high school level, they take a great deal of information on mathematics. And the, many of them go out with the mindset that, that they're going to be teaching math. They're forgetting the fact that they're teaching children math. It's really a different mindset. I'm going to be teaching children, uh, you know, high school students math. And putting into perspective that they're teaching high school students math. Are you teaching math to high school students? Are you teaching students math? It really, the person is coming from a different place depending on what it is that they'll answer you. They're teaching history. They love history. Their first subject 
as they grew up themselves is history. They want everybody in the world to be historians because they love history themselves. Have you met teachers like that? They love history, but they're forgetting that the child does not love history the same way. Right? They're forgetting that this child does not want to be learning American history or any other kind of history either. Right? And therefore, how do we communicate across those kinds of lines? So how do we generate data and what are the, what are the big professional obstacles to doing this? So we mentioned so many of them here and talking across different perspectives is one of them. Jill, do you want to add what we shared earlier? Jill had a fascinating perspective that I think is really valuable and I know people can relate. Well, I was just kind of saying how it's really difficult, um, like you were saying before, of getting everybody on board and to, to do, and to get even the other people all together in one place, like the parents and if there's um, health agencies involved and mental health agencies involved, getting that information and that sort of thing. It's really difficult to get everybody together um, to share that information. And then possibly when you do all get together, you know how we've all been in the meetings where the focus just all of a sudden shifts in three other directions and that sort of thing and nothing really ever gets accomplished from that meeting. Was there more? <laughs> yeah. What I exactly like, you know, it's it's it, what are the obstacles to aggregating data? How do you pull in the parents' perspective, and are they working with you? That's a very big, hard, challenging professional work, isn't it? And then, how do you ever get the social service agency to which the child is receiving counseling to cooperate with? And the teacher is so busy. Can you take a phone call? No, you can't. Can you go to the bathroom? You really can't right now. Isn't that true? Is it true? It really is. You, you don't have the flexibility in your professional lives as educators to grab that phone when there's somebody from the social service agency calls. But then how do you get around that? You've got to be creative. And you've got to say, listen, if you call me between such an hour on Tuesday, I can get it. Or I'll talk, make a f telephone date. That's a possibility, isn't it? Has anybody been successful with those kinds of issues? Uh, you know, successful program um, coordination between social service agencies? Are there like little links that you could put on your ISRC website or things like that that could be done? I bet there are. Any thoughts? You know, how do you coordinate with, you know, and again this might be something you could continue to consider, um, you know, how do you have really great programs between parents and schools and how do you have really as well as you possibly can coordinate between social service agencies and what creative things can be done to help facilitate that process that's something really worthwhile and there are things that can be done simple things sometimes can make such a big difference you know and and being organized and putting a day and a time on something can make some such a big difference you know so um, with all of that, we shall proceed and get into um, the next part of that. Any other closing comments on aggregating data uh, and uh, on a kind of a broad kind of a scale? I'm going to now proceed into, if you're ready to roll here, into um, the functional assessment. Um, again, you could fill that in, couldn't you? Functional assessment and functional analysis. Now, when there are particularly challenging children, and who has one of those? I know somebody in this room who does. I know a person, you have one, and you have one, and you have one, and you have more than one. Now we've got about, we've got two and more than one, so you've got a lot of them, right here in three people. So I'd say all of you have children more than likely that you wish you could really puzzle down and really get a handle on. This is what this is all about. It is the notion that you get your camera and zero, 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 zero in on a particular unique situation that is very hard to unravel, right? Now, if I were to ask you to fill in that blank, what would you fill in? There's a blank on this page, what word would you put in there? Per
purpose is a good word to put in there. That's a nice word to put in there. Another word you might put in there? You tell me, is this a good word to put in there? You tell me. Is that a good word? Yeah. The planned, you know, and in certain sense, the purpose that you're, why you're doing it in the parts, but indeed the planned outcome of a functional assessment and analysis. So you, you know, assess and then analyze is to understand these challenging, challenging, challenging 13-year-old girls who are quite an enigma, right? Why is this going on? This little child shouldn't be doing the kinds of things she's doing. And why is she? So that's what this is all about. As a teacher, you're trying to get your turn, turn at it, you know? And then the social worker will get his or her turn to say what he or she sees. The school psychologist will, and I would love to believe that as you gather all that information and sit around a multidisciplinary table, you know, you're going to get a handle on what it is that needs to be done. Again, challenges to all of those kinds of things happening are obvious, but again, that is the knowledge we have. We have amazing knowledge that if we can possibly put it all to use, we can make a lot of difference. A clear and detailed behavioral description can come out of this. So can really understanding and predicting the behavior. And so can documenting why this thing is happening. Oh, now I get it. Now I understand. And then you can come up with an intervention instead of the principal's office, which I would hope is not a common intervention. Is it or not? The assistant principal is working with her. I hope that is not a common intervention. Um, um, you can come up with interventions that match the challenges. There should be a way to work with that child. And you have in your head a, a vision of a really creative solution to this challenging situation. Now, as we think about it, that is what we're doing here. I thought I would add a little graphic for you here. As a teacher and as a, somebody who is, you know, a, 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 another member of the team, you're conducting a functional assessment and you're taking a closer look at what is happening. Now, in the next slide, you've got something is essential. Could somebody fill that in, I wonder? Something is essential. Or will I go right ahead here and share with you that connecting the dots is essential. Connecting the dots is essential. When I look at the forms that I sometimes look at when teachers and um, you know, varied people do functional assessment, the logic of what you're doing isn't always clear in that form. Oh, I fill out that space. Now I fill out this space. And it doesn't all come together. Does that ever, do you ever get that feeling? Gosh, I fill out that block. Here's the information. Fill out that block. Here's the information. Can you tell me more about that? Because I see you clearly telling me this is a problem. Can you, I'd love to hear what you're thinking. I think sometimes you just feel like to have it done right, the form has to be done right, not necessarily why you're doing it. It's a good point. Now, right behind you also, there's a, somebody. Um, the problem is there's so many people filling out the form and it's like too many um, disagreeable um, input in the, in the form. And sometimes that kind of mess up what you're really trying to get on the paper about this child. You know, so that's what's confusing when you fill out the forms and stuff that, you know, it gets kind of confusing. Because there's too many input, I mean, too many people put their input about the behavior. I think, who can relate? Who can relate that there's so much input here and it doesn't all come together to make a picture that flows? Other thoughts on that? Any other 
thoughts on, you know, trying to help, you know, I fill out my little block and I fill out the next little block and somehow I, it's not coming together the way it needs to c come together. Does that happen? I think a lot matters when the parents are on board or not. If they're saying, we don't see that behavior at home, we don't know why you're having the problem, we don't, you know, if the parents aren't on board, it, it really changes the whole dynamics because the whole team can be in agreement, but the one parent will say, I don't see it. And that affects, you know, how what they do at home, it affects so much of the whole puzzle. By all means. So the first order of business is that everybody's on the same page about the problem. What is the problem? And you can't really go into the next piece and the next piece and the next piece unless there's clarity right up front. So how do you get the parents on board? How do you get the parents on board? That's again, you know, so many obstacles. Time. You need maybe they're still grieving and they're not ready. How do you deal with that? They're still grieving and they're not ready. Is that possible? It's possible, isn't it true? It's possible. So how do you deal? Obviously, we're not alone, right? We're not alone doing this work. We have counselors with us. I see a hand, is that a stretch or a hand? Thank you so much. Um, we have a multidisciplinary team going, you know, and we are going to try our best to, to deal with those kinds of things as they come up, you know, and, and um, parents who have a child with a special need, if, if only they could get to the point that their best case scenario <laughs> is that they address the child's need. They'll, they'll be most helpful, not denying that there is a need, they'll be most helpful to the child if they could try to understand and find ways to, to really be um, creative and, and, uh, and therapeutic with this. So maybe indeed acknowledging the, the parents' unreadiness and then getting the proper assistance. Do you want to throw in any little idea in the middle of that kind of thing? Linda, have you seen that? Have you seen this happen? Just this week, she said. <laughs> Just this week. What age is the child? Uh, two different children. One middle school, one high school. Yeah. It's hard at middle school and high school because it's a surprise. This child was gone through elementary and I didn't see this. Why is this being told to me here? You know, it, it happens obviously with young children as well. How can I possibly imagine my child is not okay? But then middle school and high school, that's kind of baffling, isn't it? Don't we know that hearing is dynamic, though? And they might have been fine at elementary, but it might be deteriorating for whatever reason. Is that possible, or has it gone by all this time? In the cases of the two that you're describing, is it like something that was never noticed, was really present more than likely? It's present, it's just gotten significantly more and more as that gotten older. Yeah. And also the demands of school are higher. You know, the high, there are demands of school are higher and uh, you know, the social demands, the, you know, it's more complicated. Their lives are more complicated than when they were younger. We see that with learning disability as well. The child's learning disability went unnoted for so many years. And finally, when fourth grade comes and third grade comes, oops, now we start seeing what we didn't see earlier. You know, that kind of thing occurs. So, um, that is real, right? So how do you deal with parents who are not ready, you know? But at least you know what's going on. As a teacher, instead of trying to say, I'm going to drag you to this meeting and ignore what you're telling me. You, don't, you know, that's not going to be productive, you know? I know you're not quite ready. You know, how do you say that to, to, to a parent in the, in the best way to help them be the best possible um, resource for their child who has a special need, you know? So the logic of this, it, there's a logic, and it does make sense, but there are many obstacles to, the, to, the, to it all coming together. 
to connecting those dots. There are many obstacles, we know. We want to draw lines and we want to say it all kind of comes together in this beautiful natural kind of way. We also know well as professionals that there are so many obstacles to making all those lines come together the way we want and all those stepping stones to occur the way we want them to occur. But at least we know that these are the steps and these are the things that need to be happening. Right? I want very much today to show you that the first order of business is trying to describe the behavior. And it's just what you told us earlier. I see this and you see that. And are we talking about the same child? Of course, it might even appear that way. The first thing to do is I would really appreciate if you would be so kind as to get out your little packet and do this exercise alone first. It'll take a minute to run through. And can you see your packet with the little squares? Good, you found it. It looks like this with three little holes punched in it. It has little boxes. Would you be so kind as to quietly tell me what is directly observable? I can see this when I walk into a classroom. I can see that when I walk into a classroom. This is direct, put a, put a little, you know, check under to be curious. Can you directly see that, yes or no? And then if it's ambiguous, if it's not directly observable, put a little check over in that box. And then if it is ambiguous, oh, you know what, I'm not sure, put a, box, put a check there. And I'm so curious to see how you will do this exercise. So you've done it already? Um, that's the first step is behavioral description. What is it that you're telling me he's doing? He has a bad attitude. Can you directly see a bad attitude? Really and truly you can't. So you're going to need to tell me what he's doing. He is unengaged with the academic tasks that I'm giving him. Thank you. That really helps me to understand more about this child. Can you tell me more about his unengagement? He never brings in his homework. Now we're making progress. I don't see this child's <coughs> homework. So every person in here, all you're doing is you're looking down through that list of verbs. Is this a thing you can see? Is it not something you can see or is it ambiguous? Completed the sheet, lean over to your neighbor and see if they have agreed with you. No, because it doesn't mean it's not specific enough. You might say print, she might be writing a whole paragraph. Right.
passing you out a sheet that tells you what goes in each of the boxes. And it is, um, it is something that uh, I have given you the reference, by the way, of where this exercise comes from. Um, this is what indeed fits in that ambiguous, what indeed fits in that um, directly observable. I can see that, I can count that, I can observe that, I can measure that. So as you look at each of these things, I can see this, I can count this. And how many of those do you agree, agree you know, agrees with your analysis is what I'm so curious to note. How many times, <laughs> and who got 25 out of 25? Wouldn't that be a marathon if you could actually get them all right? I mean, accordance with the sheet that Alberto and Todman tell us, when we are developing behavioral objectives, we need to be using observable, measurable, you know, and when we are conducting observations, and when we are telling the neighbors about what's going on in your classroom, you need to be using a language that is directly observable and measurable. Who did not get the sheet? Okay, I have lots of them. Plenty of them. Most well. Who else? So that kind of helps us all to be on the same page. The child is not curious in my class. I really don't know what you're talking about, ma'am. You know? Isn't that true, Sally? The child lacks curiosity. Did you ever hear it? The child lacks curiosity. I hope not, right? What is this child doing, is your question. The child lacks curiosity. So you're going to ask the teacher, what is it that the child is doing, right? Did everybody get a sheet that helps you to put those um, observable and measurable behaviors, uh, you know, critique them, the challenge to behavioral observation, and we talked about that. Now, here is something I want to offer you. And again, you can play with this on your, on your own. There's, it's very fascinating to think about. The, there are verbs in Mr. Webster's dictionary that you cannot use when you're talking about children's behavior. They really and truly are, because they don't help us. The child has a bad attitude is one of them. You know, the child has an attitude. Does not help us to know what it is. Obviously there's displeasure on part of the person who's telling you the child has a bad attitude. But you don't really know what's going on. So you want to get a handle on what is the problem. Is it that he says, you know, is he rude? And even then, let's, what is it that he or she is doing to show a bad attitude? Can you see, write, to read orally? to talk, and that should be a new one there, the hit one, talk out, orally say, are these okay, yay or nay? They're all fine. What about these? Rudeness is the child's biggest problem. Does that tell you a lot? It really doesn't. You cannot work with somebody who tells you, who stays at that point. They need to clarify. And the person, you cannot work with a teacher who doesn't particularly provide any more insight. Would you be so kind as to maybe we'll set up a meeting to talk more specifically about what the problem is? That's what you're going to do with a situation like this. Tell me more specifically, because right now I don't have time to continue until you give me, because it, it really won't, there's no logic to what's being done if, there's, if both people are not on the same page, right? And then if the person can provide you data with how many times the child is late to your class. You know, like five days out of five, the child is late to class. And to that teacher, rudeness is a big problem. That's how the child is being rude. So now, late to class, how are we going to deal with understanding the problem? There are many reasons, possibly, why the child is late to class. And if that's the way the child is showing root, yes, thank you. Sorry, that actually is a little typo. It should have been a, a, um, a return after that. Yeah, it should have been, you know what I mean? There should have been a little return, sorry. It's just a little, a little uh, talk and then, you know, a hit is, you can see hitting. 
You can hear talking. You can observe and measure hitting and talking. You can observe and measure oral reading. You can observe and measure, is the child walking? Yes, the child is walking. You can see it and you can count it. That's the test. Can you see it? Can you count it? And if you could you know, help the team to get on the same page with what it is that you're working on, that is a crucial first step. Otherwise, all the other pieces just don't work. They fall apart, don't they? Because you can't go to the next thing now, because the next thing relies on dealing with the problem.